This is now the time of the keynote. For us here is the Tor project developer, Jacob Applebaum. A loud applause, please. Guten Morgen, meine Damen und Herren. Ich freue mich sehr, dass ich hier bin. Aber Deutsch ist nicht meine Muttersprache. So, deswegen würde weiter ich weiter auf Englisch sprechen. Es ist eine Ehre, zu hier sein. So, the Chaos Computer Club to me is like family. And it is such an honor to be able to speak to everyone here. And it is ridiculous that they asked me to give the keynote. I hope that I am not wasting 3,000 collective hours of the smartest people on the planet with what I have to say in the next 60 minutes. <laughs> I want to start by thanking everyone that is in the audience for being here and for some specific people. Um, I want to call out Laura Poitras, who is this woman here next to the woman with the camera, because she produced the, and edited the videos that we're going to see. Uh, I've been working with her quite a lot, and she's a very inspirational, wonderful artist who I love deeply. And I'd like to start by playing a video, um, which is part of an art project we're working on, that many people are working on. And if we could play that first video, I think it would be a good way to start this off. Fantastic. So. Now we have an idea about what my talk will be about, right? Just in case there was any question that I was going to change horses midstream. This is a location. It's called Bluffdale, Utah. And this is one of the largest data centers that we know of that the NSA is currently constructing. And there is a question, of course, about what it is that they are trying to build, why they're building it, what exactly they plan to do with this space, and how they will use this space. And I'm going to talk a bit about this. Nice. And what I'm hoping to also point out is that this is everyone's department. So in this case, what we see is the construction of the actual Bluffdale, Utah site. So this is the slow process. But there's not really anything in particular one might object to in this process. It's just construction of a very large building. And I'm going to read some addresses now that were passed out when Bill Binney, Laura, and I did a show at the Whitney. 2651 Olive Street, St. Louis, Missouri, 63103, United States. 420 South Grand, Los Angeles, California, 90071, United States. 611 Folsom Street, San Francisco, California, 94107, United States. 51 Peachtree, Northeast Atlanta, Georgia, 3030, United States. 10 South Canal, Chicago, Illinois, 60606, United States. 30 East Street, Southwest Washington, D.C., 20024, United States. 811 10th Avenue, New York, New York, 10019, United States. 12976, Hollenberg Drive, Bridgetown. These addresses are potentially domestic interception points for the NSA in the United States. One of them is confirmed, according to Mark Klein, who blew the whistle and discussed the fact that the NSA was doing domestic surveillance. I and many other people believe that the purpose of this data center is to build something to store and process massive interception, where some of the calculations by Bill Binney, who was an analyst with the NSA for almost 40 years, he thinks that this this center will be used to store this information for probably somewhere around 100 years. And so in theory, we might say that that's no big deal. We have nothing to worry about. I very much want to make sure that we cover in this talk that's going to happen right now 
that this, this right here is in the back of everyone's mind. A data center designed to store things for 100 years seems like a reasonable theory for this. And if you read the information that is present about it, you will in fact see that that seems like it's probably an understatement. And probably since there are more than just a single, there's, there is more than just a single facility like this, that there's the possibility that 100 years is a short version. And that's an extremely scary proposition. So part of the reason I wanted to show you that, I, I want to lead with that, but I want to tell you a quote, which is, nothing strengthens the judgment and quickens the conscience like individual responsibility, which is a quote by a feminist known as Elizabeth Stanton. This, I think, is a, is a useful thing when talking about things not being our department. Because what do we have to do with the NSA? What do we have to do with, with this giant data center that's being built in Bluffdale? Well, in essence, part of the thing that is so scary is that with the internet and with communication systems as they exist today, there really isn't a, a, a geographical border that really changes what we can and cannot care about in the ways that we used to. The fact of the matter is that the NSA's interception, those, those interception points, they will carry not just Americans' data, they will carry everyone's data for the internet. So caring about this data center is in fact a very serious thing that we need to consider because in fact it does impact everyone. But even if we didn't use the internet, it impacts the people that we care about in a transitive way. So I'm hoping that in the course of the next 50 minutes, I'll be able to convince you that these things are your department. And I sort of want to start to talk about what Rob and Frank had talked about for the last few years. And have any of you seen these talks that they've given, such as the We Lost the War talk and how society might collapse? Or did you see a show of hands for that? Okay, so about half of you. I want to say that they talked about this and they said that, you know, we have lost the war, the surveillance state war. You know, basically so many people have decided to go to the dark side, as it's been called, that is working on deep packet inspection, censorship equipment, surveillance equipment, targeting information, etc. cetera. This, this is, in fact, what has happened. If you look at the jobs that pay very well, that people are aware of, they usually are systems of control types of jobs. There are research positions, obviously, that exist in the world, but it pays better to work for a Lockheed Martin than it does to work for a university. So people will choose, I think, for sometimes good reasons, or for understandable reasons to do these types of tasks. And sometimes people will even make moral arguments saying things like, because of Stuxnet, we were able to avoid violence or bombing of a factory. Of course, the reality is that these things are not used alone. They're used together and in concert with bombings of factories. So it's certainly worth mentioning that these guys, Frank and Rop, as well as many other people who did not stand up and tell the Congress about their ideas, that these people were really on to something. And unfortunately now, we, we actually live in the world that they were describing that was coming. And it's an incredibly scary world. And in the last few years, I've had the misfortune of being targeted by a large section of this world. And I can tell you that it's been quite an uncomfortable series of uh, days. Just one day after the other is the way to take it or the way to deal with it. And this is not a comfortable or easy way to live. And when Frank and Rob talked about this, they still had some kind of hope in their voice. And I think that that was important. So what I wanted to do was to try to take that hope and to focus on it and to try to take it and, and say that despite the fact that there are these oppressive systems of control and despite the fact that we do now live in a surveillance state, that it may still, I think reasonably so, be possible to resist the surveillance state and to turn things around if we wish. And I think that there may come a time in which that is not true. Um, I don't believe that that time has yet arrived. So Frank wanted me very much to stress this notion that we can make a choice about what we do with our time. That is this notion of the dark and the light side. I personally don't think that the sort of black and white, white hat, black hat ethics make any sense because I don't define my ethical or moral framework by making comparisons to black and white 1950s cowboys movies. And I'd like to say that there's some nuance there, but there are some simple things that you can do to decide if you're working on something which is oppressive. And one of them is just to ask yourself if you're working on a system that helps to control others or if you're working on a system that helps to enable others to have control over their own lives. And this is a really simple test 
If you're working on deep packet inspection that will be deployed on people who do not get a say in it, you probably are working for the oppressor. It's not guaranteed because there are many layers of indirection. Blue Coat probably doesn't think of themselves as being a tool in a military dictatorship's toolbox, but the reality is that when the Assad government or when the Burmese military dictatorship or their, their uh, alleged free market companies in Burma use Blue Coat, which they both do, uh, they have for some time and they will probably continue to, Blue Coat is in fact part of that system of control. Now, are they responsible? That's a good question. I don't have an answer to that, but I do have an answer to whether or not I think that they play a role in it, and that is that they do. What role will, it, it remains to be seen. And what I'm hopeful about is that some people, especially the people in this room, have actually made the choice that is the opposite of that. They've decided to work on systems that help enable people to be free. When, for example, we see that Mitch Altman from Noisebridge has dedicated his life to teaching people about electronics and to open hardware and free software, we see that he is enabling people in a positive way. And this is something that we as a community, I think, should really step up commending people who do this. Bunny Huang, who builds open hardware, he is a hero. When, you can applaud that if you wish. <clears throat> The thing is that I, I probably can't do it, but I wrote a name, a list of names of people that inspired me over breakfast one day, and it's pretty long, so I'm not gonna read all of it. But the same is true for Lady Ada, Christine Corbett, and amazing people everywhere, people who don't have names, who are basically anonymous in the community. But we should look to them, and we should look to them with pride, and we should look to them with support and mutual aid and solidarity, because it's not just negative stuff. Not everybody in here works for Finn Fisher, right? And in fact, probably more people in here work against Finn Fisher. Thanks for that. And so to that end, we can make a choice about which, what we'd like to do. And it is possible to make a living making free software for freedom instead of closed source proprietary malware for cops. But there's a cost. To that. And so I want to, I want to point out something in this next video, which is I'm going to be silent while it plays, unlike the last one. Um, and it's a minute long. So if you could play that. Does the NSA routinely intercept American citizens' emails? No. Does the NSA intercept Americans' cell phone conversations? No. Google searches? No. Text messages? No. Amazon.com orders? No. Bank records? No. What judicial consent is required for NSA to intercept communications and information involving American citizens? Within the United States, that would be the FBI lead. If it was a foreign actor in the United States, the FBI would still have to lead and could work that with, the, with NSA or other intelligence agencies as authorized. But to conduct that kind of, of collection in the United States, it would have to go through a court order, and the court would have to authorize it. We are not authorized to do it, nor do we do it. Well, I think you can all understand the subtext there, which is that I'm protected, but you're not. I bet that makes you feel really great. So that data center we were looking at, what he just testified in front of Congress about, that was General Alexander. He's the most powerful person in the world, probably. Even more powerful than the President of the United States or any leader of any other country. He controls the intelligence infrastructure for the entire NSA, and he has ties to the rest of the intelligence community as well. So what he's basically saying is that, you know, if there was an American, hypothetically in America, they'd probably be fine which really doesn't make me feel good because there are seven billion people on this planet and just a few of them are Americans. Why should they be treated specially in this regard? So that giant data center that we see, it's for all of you. And it's also for me because despite the fact that I'm an American, being associated with WikiLeaks is like, well, it's, it's not a good time in America. <clears throat> so there's a thing to be said here, which is that that guy's a fucking liar, first of all because we know for a fact we know for a fact from Mark Klein that the NSA was in fact doing dragnet surveillance of all of those things. 
So straight up, the guy's a liar. But then on top of being a liar, which is bad enough in this context, he doesn't even bother to pretend that you have any value at all, and that you have rights, and that your privacy is important, and that your human dignity matters because of where you happen to be born and what flag he imagines you flying. That to me is very depressing, and I feel like it actually gives the rest of humanity that lives in America a very bad name. And so I'm very sorry for that. But I want to talk about some other things that tie together with that. Because if we just think about massive surveillance and isolation, we, I think, will we'll have quite a problem, quite a series of problems, in fact. So let's talk about some things that all have commonality with the surveillance state. First of all, data retention and retroactive policing, which is clearly a human rights violation in Europe. It's clearly the case that this type of activity taking place creates suspects out of everyone. And being a suspect is to already not be free, in my experience. And in fact, in the 1800s, there was a British author who wrote that to be free from suspicion is one of the first freedoms that is important for being free in the rest of your life when you are followed around, when you are being investigated because of the whim of someone, this is the beginning of the end of your freedom. So it seems that data retention is the, begin to, is the beginning of the end of many of our freedoms in bulk. And that is a very scary, very scary thing. And when people do retroactive policing, it is when they apply that lack of freedom in a very specific way. And then they take these actions they depends, of course, on which state you happen to be in and which fiber optic cables happened to be in use when your bits were crossing it. But how does this actually play out? It depends, right? And it depends in a very specific sense. So, for example, drone killings, and I'm not just talking about Anwar al-Waki's innocent 16-year-old son in Yemen, but drone killings of thousands of people. The targeting information is fed to the CIA and to other groups from surveillance listening points, from intelligence factories. So there is a direct relationship between surveillance and support of straight up murder. That is something which sounds scary, but what makes it even scarier is that the way that those drone killings are carried out is that the central committee who gets to decide who lives and dies, or Obama's assassination star chamber, that central committee, which sounds a lot to me like some of the Soviet uh, rhetoric I remember from my childhood, that central committee decides non-democratically who gets to be assassinated. And it's just a hop or two away from surveillance. So when you assist the surveillance state, you literally are helping to kill fucking children. That's something which is maybe not going to help me sleep at night. And you can choose not to be a part of that. Almost every person in here, I think, has made that choice. But if you're on the fence, I guess you can guess where I would suggest you go. But there are some more ties, because let's say that drone killing just seems a little too far off, right? Well, in Uganda, there has been a, a proposal for some time now, which seems to be s almost pushed back, but not quite, where they wish to make it a death sentence for being a homosexual, where aggravated homosexuality is a crime. I think that's where you continue to flip your wrist. I'm not quite sure what aggravated homosexuality means, but this basic notion that someone would be forced to report on you, or they would also go to prison. This is something which surveillance will impact greatly, and it will make a huge difference. Of course, we can talk about wider things, such as the Chinese oppression of the Tibetan people. We can talk about police backdoors and other so-called lawful interception malware. We can talk about wars of aggression in Iraq and Afghanistan. The surveillance state touches everything. And it is more than that. It is the fact that the surveillance state is it is part of a system of control that causes much suffering. It may also bring some good things into this world, but with the secrecy, the surveillance state becomes something that is totally unaccountable. So we can look at some other things that are quite concerning, and we can see that there are ties that are not as obvious. The military trials of political prisoners in Egypt, the genocide of the Syrian people right now, the British and Swedish justice regarding Julian Assange, the right-wing Nazi sympathizers here in Germany that gave murdering Nazis passports and help and are still not held to account. The oppression and crackdown on WikiLeaks related or so-called WL tainted people. Companies that sell equipment to brutal dictatorships and authoritarian regimes for both surveillance or censorship, sometimes both. The reality is that secret police and spying agencies 
actually change our ability to govern ourselves freely. And they do it in such a way that it is not obvious and it is seemingly impossible to resist. Because these things themselves are secret, it becomes extremely difficult for us to even know where to begin resisting. At its core in the United States where this has gone is that we have secret laws with secret interpretations and a total lack of accountability. And fundamentally what these things are is that they are oppressive vanguardist approaches that are vanguard approaches to authoritarianism. They're insultingly paternalistic and allegedly above the law. If you've ever had the opportunity to meet some of the people that work in these intelligence agencies that are still there, some of them are quite good. They're fundamentally awesome people. But then when it comes to their job, they're in a pretty terrible place. That is, if they wish to keep their job, they are not really free to dissent. If we look at people, for example, like Bill Binney and Thomas Drake, what we see is that when you dissent, you will be crushed. Your family life will be ruined. There are huge costs to telling the truth, and there are huge costs to asking for a more just system. Bill Binney really actually blew my mind in a particular way. I thought, surely a guy who worked at the NSA for 40 years, we wouldn't have a lot in common. But it turns out that he, he said to me that he thought that the spying was actually an immoral thing, but that maybe during the Cold War it was a necessary evil. That is, he thought that maybe they could prevent total atomic warfare. And at the same time, he recognized that it was not the right thing to do to spy on people, that that should not be the end in itself. I was really touched by that because usually it is the case that someone would say, well, except for Americans, you can spy on everybody but not Americans. And for him, the turning point, as I understand it, was that he decided that it was wrong to spy on everybody. And when they decided to spy on Americans, it was clear that they could not be trusted to spy even on any person, any single person, and to do it in a way which would be producing justice. That was very surprising to me. It actually made me change my mind quite a lot about people who might work at the NSA. But then it turns out that he has suffered a great deal as a result of having that opinion. So maybe it doesn't change my mind that much about the people that are still there. But fundamentally, human rights, in theory, should be something that we can work for collectively as a, as a human race, as a group of people. And yet it doesn't really seem that that is what is happening. There's a lot of rhetoric about it. But when you kill hundreds of thousands of people, it's very difficult to talk about the benefits of these technologies in a way that doesn't seem like grouping, just simple, simple grouping. So it, it happens that we develop these, these sort of psychological defenses to it. So half of the people that I have met and discussed this with when this is the first time they've considered the surveillance state. They talk about it in terms of their initial reaction where they've put in five minutes of thought. And they say, well, it doesn't concern me or it won't impact me. In fact, the only people who are getting it are people who deserve it. You know, they're under legitimate investigation. Not actually sure what a legitimate investigation is when you can't actually hold people to account and there are secret laws. Right? Rule by law and the rule of law are not exactly the same thing. Rule by decree doesn't mean that it is just simply because it's written down, especially if the interpretation is secret. So after people recognize maybe that it might impact them, there's a fantastic set of things that takes place. And one of them is that people will try to minimize their role in it, saying something along the lines of, well, it won't be possible to sort me out and to find me in this massive data set. Or even if I do stand out, nothing will happen to me. And then eventually, if they happen to be as unlucky as I have been in the last few years, they'll say something along the lines of, well, the system works and no injustice will occur because the state is benign. There are not many people that I have met that have gotten to that stage who actually continue to think that for very long. It might be worth considering that perhaps we don't have to get to that point to recognize that there is great folly in that, that set of thoughts and that plan for thinking about it. It might be the case that the surveillance state that exists, in fact, is negative, even if we do not yet understand fully its negative effects. So you see this also as a social defense in groups, as a reaction. I think probably the split between WikiLeaks and OpenLeaks is the greatest example of the fact that groups, even effective groups, will split and then they'll have bad blood and it will in fact deliver utter failure. And it's very sad, tragic even. And this kind of stuff is something which, even when trying to resist it, we aren't quite aware of how these types of things happen. I mean, history shows us certain ways that these kinds of splits might occur. But it isn't the case that we fully grok those historical lessons. 
So it's quite sad, in fact, that we focus so much of our energy on degrading things. Like someone does a great thing and someone says, ah, yes, but this one thing. And the discussion becomes about that one thing. I think, in fact, it might make sense to focus on the good things as well. It is true that sometimes people produce free hardware, but it has one binary blob. That does not mean that we should not thank this person and give them credit. In fact, to really praise them for putting in so much effort to make everything as open as was possible. And it's too bad one thing isn't open, but maybe we could put in that effort to open up and free that one thing. It's, it's basically the same statement, but the way that it's stated allows us to think of it as being in it together. And it helps to keep people together, and it helps to keep people motivated to work together, in fact. Um, I think it's a useful idea to try to take this tact. We also have these psychological defenses about the physical world, which I personally have experienced quite a lot. Um, for example, this notion that warrants are required to enter your house that your physical location is somehow protected is a very quaint notion. I certainly don't believe that anymore. It's a little sad, but it does not seem to be the case. In the United States, there's a thing called the Patriot Act, and Section 215 of the Patriot Act essentially says something, and it's interpreted completely differently. That is, there's a secret interpretation of Section 215 of the Patriot Act. And if you ask Bill Binney about this, what he would say is that everything is fair game. That is to say that regardless of what you thought the Constitution said, or regardless of what you think the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights says, that's not what's really going on. And so this, this defense that people have, that they're a journalist, so they're protected, no one will do anything to them, it's nonsense. Every journalist in the United States that is subject to the warrantless wiretapping's tentacles is being surveilled, regardless of journalistic protections. Every member of Congress, everybody in this room, probably especially everyone in this room, and of course, people will say something like, well, you know, don't cross a border with anything. Don't, that's just so stupid. So for example, when I crossed a border with a telephone, I'm not actually allowed to tell you what happened to my telephones. And obviously, it was a mistake to cross a border with a telephone, but uh, it wasn't that much of a mistake because the telephone connects to the telephone system, and every phone number in that phone had been used to make or receive calls. So it's not like the data wasn't already in the hands of the oppressor. It was, in fact, the case that it was just slightly better indexed. But it also had some extra numbers in there just for fun. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to have a, a surveillance state that's going to get people for guilt of association, you might want to make sure there are a few jerks in your phone book, right? So, <clears throat> but... <clears throat> But the reality is that while I can cross a border without anything of consequence, that is me deciding to become subdued, and it is me deciding to accept the oppression. And everyone here can make that choice, but I say, fuck that, that's not a choice that we should make. That's in fact a coping mechanism. And these kinds of coping mechanisms are a response to feeling a lack of agency, a feeling of total helplessness. For example, people will run through their mind, like, how will I eat? How will I feed my children? How will I educate them? If I, if I don't uh, play along, if I don't comply, they'll make my life hell. Part of the problem here, and it's funny to say it in Europe because it's such a different context, but part of the problem here is the state. When the state has the power to make you make those kinds of thoughts appear in your head, when it allows you to create that and to make those choices, we become less free. So maybe recognizing those coping mechanisms and then trying to progress to the next one, trying to progress to the next thought could be helpful. I think that it's helpful. And for me, what I have tried to do is that I have tried to recognize that I am trying to cope with a situation that is impossible to cope with at times. I mean, there's really nothing quite going to ruin your night, like feeling like an entire state is stepping on your throat. It's not even great to talk about at parties. I mean, it's, there's really not a lot that is good about it. But there is some good that can come of it, and that is to show other people that it is not total, that it does not merely end in tears. I mean, it might, but it doesn't every single day. You get to choose how this goes. I had the opportunity recently to meet the Dalai Lama in India about two weeks ago, and to meet the Tibetan people who had escaped from Tibet under the oppressive Chinese rule, people who had been shot, their stomachs ripped out, their skulls cracked open, their teeth knocked out, their families jailed, you name it. They've experienced it. And I realized I have no problems, by comparison especially. But I recognize something, which is that these are the friendliest, nicest people you can imagine. 
I mean, it's really quite a touching thing. Despite the fact that about 100 years ago they were a brutal theocracy, they certainly have learned since then. And it is the case that we can decide how it is we cope with these things. We can become increasingly cold and atomized. We can become destroyed. Or we can undermine our communities. We can work against our own interests in the long run, or we can choose to try to find joy in the life that we have. And we can try to have a better world than the one that we have just come from, that we have experienced. When I look at Bill Binney and Thomas Drake and Jessalyn Radcliffe and John Kirku, who are some amazing whistleblowers in the United States, and three of them are in fact in the audience here and have a talk later today that you should attend. It is the best thing, I think, at the Congress. And I'm including this talk. So <laughs> these guys and Jessalyn are amazing, and I recommend that you hear their story because they will be able to tell you about what it is like to stand up for the right things and to even to try to do it in the most straightforward way possible exactly by the book. Vinny basically took a decade working through the system itself only to find out that the system itself isn't working to take care of the problems it's supposed to take care of. So this is a guy who, in my opinion, went through every possible hoop that I wouldn't have even to bother, I wouldn't even have bothered to jump through. But he proved to me that I wouldn't bother for a good reason. <laughs> I mean, it, didn't, it, it does not work out well. And I mean, there is something to be said about this, but their story, I can't do justice by talking about it. Just the same way that I can't do justice to the story of Bradley Manning. I can't do justice to the story of Julian and what he is facing right now. But what I can say about these things is that if you compare and contrast them with Robert Bales, the alleged Kandahar massacre-er, I guess you could say, is that when you do things in service of the state, even if it is killing, allegedly, 20 Afghanis, they will whisk you away, give you time for your family to move, and instead of, in the case of Binny, having a, a gun to his head while he's taking a shower, they just make sure to take him to the general population of Leavenworth right away. Compare that with Manning, for example, who instead spent you know, months in being tortured in Quantico before moving to the general population of Leavenworth. So there's something to be said about these kinds of examples that have come before. And I think what it is, is that there are people who will have a very hard path when they choose this path. It is worth choosing that harder path. Bill and Thomas and Jessalyn have worked very hard on trying to show the world that in fact it is not, it's not completely worth giving up on, but it is not an easy, it is not an easy task to go through. And when talking with Thomas about what the impact has been on his family, it is clear to me that the state intended for that hardship as one of their tactics. But the return is that it used to be that people would think that me or someone up here talking about the surveillance state, talking about the Utah data center, that we were completely fucking crazy. But now that's not the point. No one thinks that anymore. Now we understand that the NSA's warrantless wiretapping program is real. We understand that the data center is there to spy on all of us. We're no longer reeling from that fact. We're no longer denying that. That is the reality. It is because of the things that they have done that that is the case. It's because of the bravery that they have had in their hearts and the suffering that they have endured. And the point is not to make it a pity party for them. And the point is not to say that anonymity is not important. It is simply that anonymity in itself is not enough. It takes more than that. Anonymity will buy you time, but it will not buy everyone else justice. It certainly won't even buy them justice. And it wouldn't have helped them anyway, because in the long run, it's easy with a total surveillance state to try to de-anonymize people. In fact, I think it would be quite easy to de-anonymize almost anyone in a total surveillance state, because our behavioral patterns will give us up. Our writing will give us up. So, in, in theory, the things that I've said are things that are not probably new to anyone here. And you often hear that as a tactic for dismissal. Well, it's nothing new. It's nothing special there. And I, I hear that. And I'd like to raise you a please stop adults are talking. Because it is true that some of these things are not new, but the reality is that we need to actually do something about it, regardless of how long we've known that it is wrong. So there are things that we can, in fact, do. And it is worth mentioning that this is not just happening to people that are 
whistleblowers or associated with the most dangerous people on the internet or anonymity or something like that. This happens to regular people. I'm going to tell you briefly for about two minutes an, an example of this. And it's a very personal example, which I sort of have been debating about whether or not I was going to mention. And I think I'll mention it just because I think that it is important. In the United States, it's probably not surprising to most of the people here, I have a mother. And my mother, I know, I know. but. Uh, my mother and I are not particularly close, and unfortunately for her, she's quite mentally ill. And it's a very sad story, and her life is quite tragic, more tragic than any person that I have mentioned so far. But what is most tragic about her is that in the last two years, about the time that my harassment from the United States government started, but probably not related, she was arrested and jailed. And the state broke basically every law that you can imagine in arresting her, including breaking into her, her house without a warrant for arrest or for search. Despite the fact that she was arrested under totally bogus circumstances, and despite the fact that her life has been utterly destroyed, where her house has been taken and her property has been taken from her, and she has literally nothing left, she was forcibly committed to a mental institution. And as a result, they decided that they can hold her for three years without a trial. Now, being mentally ill is not in itself a crime, but because she was arrested for something else that is allegedly a crime, this means that they can keep her until she is competent, thus effectively criminalizing insanity, which is too bad. She is legitimately mentally ill and could use help. But the way that they decided to help her was by destroying her life such that when she gets off on the charges that she faces, she will have nothing to return to. So these are the effects of a totalitarian society that goes after Bill Binney, Thomas Drake, Jessalyn Radcliffe, Bradley Manning, Julian Assange, and myself. And she told me, and though she is quite insane, it's difficult to know if it's true, that she was interrogated twice about me and WikiLeaks. Once before she was being treated, and then once after she had been forcibly injected with antipsychotic medicines. Now, that's a pretty upsetting thing, to say the least. But the most upsetting part is I don't know if it's her crazy ramblings, because she is quite crazy, or if it's true. But the important part is that if we just take it as it seems, which is that this is a person who has fallen on hard times, what we can take from this is that this is everybody's problem. I mean, it's actually also technically my problem. But the important part here is to recognize that she is what is happening to everyday regular people in American society. And that's a really upsetting reality, to have that happen. So what can we do about these things, right? I mean, if you're still not convinced that this is what happens to regular people and that you will skate by just fine, <clears throat> I don't know what I could say, really, to convince you. But uh, I suppose I could say to look to the children who have been killed by drones who are also innocent and see what kind of justice that they have. But it seems to me that rather we have to fight against things. But we have to do more than just fight against them, because merely fighting against things becomes corrosive. In my mother's situation, fighting against her unju unjust imprisonment, the same for Bradley Manning, the same for Assange, the same for all of the people that have been unjustly harassed, or worse, that burns you out, and it destroys your life. And it destroys your ability to feel hope, to have fun, to be able to relax. I can't even remember the last time that I did not go to sleep wondering if I would wake up with a gun in my mouth when living in the United States. Because that's the kind of world that we live in now. And maybe, maybe you're lucky and you don't live in that world. But the reality is that lots of people do live in that world. And whether or not they deserve it, there's something to be said about people who are not arrested who have to worry about that kind of stuff. Maybe that's not the world we want to live in. So what if instead we tried to not just fight against things, but to build alternatives, and specifically to try to build sustainable alternatives, and to come to terms with the fact that we are losing our democracies around the world, and that we are losing our agency, where we are increasingly depressed about the kind of democratic oversight that we have, and feeling like we don't have representation in our respective parliaments and congresses. That, I think, is a, is a really good step to take, because it means that we can start to take other steps. Because once we admit we have this problem, we can try to do something about this problem. At the Tor Project, one of the things that we've been trying to do is to build a thing called the Uniprobe. And Arturo Filasto and Isis Lovecraft, who are two of the most awesome Python hackers on the planet, they have been working on a probe 
to try to detect internet censorship so that we can do something about this. They are building a positive alternative where we will have data to be able to talk about human rights violations in the context of scientific observation, which will allow us to actually be able to have conversations about whether or not this does the right thing for our societies, whether or not these are trade issues. This kind of constructive approach is awesome, and we should applaud it. I don't know if you want to stand up, Artero, but you should. I, re I recently used this code. I wrote the very, very first version of Uniprobe, and Arturo was so disgusted with it that he rewrote it from scratch. I admit, I think that that is probably the right choice. But uh, I used it in Burma. And using this, we accidentally discovered a new way to detect censorship and surveillance that we had not previously considered, which was even if you don't know a censored site, if you use Twisted, it's so efficient that it will crash the blue code device for non-censored sites. Thank you, blue code. <laughs> these, these kinds of positive, constructive approaches are worth talking about, and there are lots of them. Everybody that's worked on GNU, projects, everyone that's worked on free software and open source software, everyone in this room that has worked on hardware, who's worked on documentation, these are things which we should try to focus on, and we should do it towards some goals. We should try to consider that when we build free and open source software, when we build free and open source hardware, we are enabling people to be free in ways that they previously were not. Literally, people that write free software are granting liberties. About. Ten days ago, I had the, I guess, pleasure is the word, uh, to go to Burma. And I met some free software hackers who live in a situation which is almost unthinkable. One person I met had been sentenced to 15 years in jail for receiving an email with a political cartoon in it. And it was considered receiving illegal information or something along these lines. And he served four years in a hard labor prison camp before being released earlier this year. So the conditions for hacking, the conditions in which communication is not free, where SIM cards cost $250, where there's massive class stratification with regard to the internet and censorship, these, these people are working on building free software there, literally free software for freedom. So when you work here on free software for freedom, you are enabling them to also work on freedom. This is a kind of mutual aid and solidarity which you don't even need to know that you are doing in specific. But you are. So everyone that is working on free and open source hardware and software is actually concretely building a better world. And yeah, there are exceptions. There are sometimes people who make new licenses because they don't feel like they get enough credit. I think it was Theo Durate that said that. And I mean, it happens. But ultimately, overall, it is a positive thing. And writing free software is great. And ultimately, part of the goal here, I think, something that we can agree on, is to try to live enjoyable lives that are free from coercive force. This is something that, regardless of how we live our lives, that is probably something that we wish to work towards everyone being able to have as their life, to be free, and in a very specific sense, where they get to choose what it is their freedom represents, where they get to choose how their life goes. Working towards that, you might be able to call it, as Peter Singer would say, a preference-based utilitarianism. The reality is that I'm never going to believe in your God, but I'm going to respect the fact that you might believe that God exists. We have to come to terms with the fact that we live in a pluralistic world, whether or not some people like it, right? The right-wing Nazis that the German secret police were helping, those guys didn't want to believe it, but those guys are dying out, even though there are a lot of them. There are seven billion people on the planet, and no single person is going to be able to usher in their dreams of getting rid of the rest of the people that don't believe in them. And that's great, by the way. I say that as someone of Jewish descent standing in Hamburg right now, which is fantastic. <clears throat> so even though Rop, who is in the audience here, is feeling pretty burnt out and is feeling that things are hard, because they are hard, it doesn't mean that it's a lost cause. He wants to go and build a farm, and I'm not sure where he is right now in the audience, but, but uh, he wants to go and build a farm, and he wants to have a good time. And I think that's great. I think that that is a method of resistance that is worth exploring. But I also think for people that aren't yet burned out that there's a changing of the guards that is taking place. 
And so it is a new generation's time to do what Rob has done for the last 30 years. Is that about right? <laughs> Gosh, we should thank him for that, I might add. So we should, I think, stop trying to fool ourselves when we say that we don't care about things or that we want to help, but we don't help the things that are obvious and directly in front of our face. We should try to work together, I think, to try to build independent structures to replace the parts of the state that have been dismantled. This is something which is, I think, highfalutin and difficult for people to grok, but part of the reason that we lose so much in our societies is because we don't have democratic control over the things that matter to us. So what we need to do is to try to replace those structures, the structures especially that are missing, and that includes stuff that's not very sexy like childcare and education, as well as you know, open and free baseband's for cell phones. It's all related. So I think we have to move from a world where we act, not just a world where we react. And there is a story about Emma Goldman, who is one of the greatest feminists and anarchists to ever walk on this earth in terms of the work that she has done. And she talked about how she wanted to see the world to be a better place. And she wanted to bring about this anarchist utopia. And an old man confronted her saying, well, I would like one hour extra of leisure time. And I recognize that compromising makes it difficult, but you know, I'm old and I will die and I will never know your anarchist utopia. So one extra hour of leisure time a week is very useful to me and it's all that I will ever see. And so I think it's a good reminder, and that story, I, I, I tell it briefly and badly in order to try to tell you that the, the means, in fact, are the ends in most of the activities that we take. So the people that are breaking into computers and spying on people for the state, those people put people in prison, often as unjustly, even in some cases justly. Even though I'm not a fan of it, I understand that there can be some good that comes from it. But the reality is that that means that the control structure has become one that breaks into things and spies on people. That is the end for the people who meet that as their untimely end. And I recognize that this kind of means ends discussion is one that is quite controversial. But the reality is that when we don't act with compassion on a daily basis for people who are suffering every day, when we look the other way because of petty fights, as an example, the way that many people, because they do not like certain aspects of Julian Assange or Bradley Manning, that they look the other way for the injustice that they face, even despite the fact that there is a difference of opinion about many things. People do not deserve to be tortured and people do not deserve to be unjustly imprisoned. To me, I think that, you can clap if you want. <clears throat> Well, I feel bad for mentioning his name now. Moxie Marlinspike, who's a great guy, and uh, I love the guy. He's fantastic. You know, he, he says that part of the problem is that we, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but people feel like we don't have any agency. We can't do anything about all the bad shit that we see in the world. But the reality is that we actually do. So if you believe, let's take a survey. Raise your hand if you think anonymity is something that is good and that you think is a fundamental right we should all have. Now raise your hand if you want to do something about it. Now keep your hand up if you're going to run a tour relay. <laughs> Everybody that put your hand down, why aren't you running a tour relay? You can do something about it right now. There are costs. But this is the point. We do have the agency and sometimes we make the choice not to use it and I respect that. We have that choice and I'm glad that it's a choice. But we should recognize that when we choose not to do things or when we are afraid, that that is what it is. Bravery is not an absence of fear. It is continuing to do things even when you are afraid because you know that it is the right thing to do. So it is important to be brave and to acknowledge that there is fear. It is important to refuse to be atomized in our society. It is important, I think, to have solidarity with broad causes rather than simply pointing out the differences of things that we do not agree with. Having mutual aid with humanity as a whole is something which is very highfalutin and in, out in outer space in a sense. But this is the hacker community that wants to put people on the moon. So I believe that we can accomplish a little goodwill towards each other as well.
So I mentioned that this was going to be about resistance, but I wanted to actually say that it's beyond resistance because part of resistance is really trying to make sure that people are doing something differently. But what if instead of making sure they do something differently, we make sure that there are alternatives available for people to freely choose? Right? That's part of the thing that's happening here. People aren't going to choose to starve. People are going to choose to do the things that keep their families fed. So we have to replace the structures that allow for that starvation. And likewise, we have to make sure that as we build those structures, we build them in ways that are just and sustainable for people. We have to make sure that while leaking and whistleblowing are a fundamentally useful set of tactics towards a long-term strategy of transparency, that there are lots of other things. Gene Sharp's writings on the topics are extremely awesome, and I recommend you read them. Because singing and dancing in the street, even though it doesn't seem like it's helpful, it is documented to have brought down dictatorships. There are lots of things that we can do to continue and to really carry forward the bit of democracies that we have left in this world and actually to expand them further and to help other people. And it's worth doing it, right? I mean, hacktivism as a strategy is, I think, worthwhile. But it's worth also mentioning that while breaking into something is sometimes technically quite difficult, it's fundamentally much easier than building something, building something that is something that everyone can use freely something that is going to benefit people. But let's talk about some of these basic tactics for just a moment, because I'm almost out of time. But there are things that are scary. Like when I say that we should get rid of secret police in the world, people expect lightning to strike or a sniper rifle to like release some magic pink dust from the back of my neck. But the thing is that the secrecy is what gives power. And so I think what we should try to do is that if we have secret police that are not democratically interfering with society, you should out them. That's important to do. Reveal them. Reveal who it is that is doing a thing that is decidedly illegal and ask for accountability. If it is decidedly illegal that they are doing something that is, for example, helping right-wing murderers, then show that that's not what society actually wishes these people to do. Because otherwise there is a kind of culpability. This notion that it's not your department is nonsense. It's all of our department. You get to make a choice between living a life where you are going to have quite a lot of shame in the end or one where the whole earth is your department. And that's a choice we all get to make and we all make it all the time. I'm honestly humbled that people like Karsten Losing in, in the front row here could have chosen to work a cushy job at a university, but he chose to work on metrics for the Tor project. He's a brilliant guy who can probably do anything he would want, and he has chosen to do great work helping people to speak freely. And the same with Linus Nordberg and with George and with other people in this audience. So you can make that choice, and the, the return is the freedoms that we actually have now in our life. So I think that, you know, I want to close by saying that when you hear that governments are murdering people, that you don't just brush it off, that you actually think about it. You look to who's accountable about it and collect data. Rop actually encouraged me to think about this. We may not be able to bring justice for people today, but when we have data on the people that have done this tomorrow, tomorrow might be the day when we get to bring those people justice. Not brushing it off, not becoming desensitized to it, keeping that around, that will allow us to hold people accountable later, even though right now we can't. License plate scanners across your city, get that data. One useful thing you can do with that data is you can reveal all of the covert surveillance taking place in that city. Think about it for a few minutes and you'll figure it out. It's not very hard. So then reveal that information because spying is wrong, because spying is an affront to your human dignity. Data retention, same deal. Get that data, use that data for something useful. Try to make sure that it is clear that those are not the decisions and trade-offs we want, where a total surveillance state won't actually allow even special people to retain their specialness. It's quite dangerous when you have a total surveillance state, but we have not yet fully understood that yet. But we work towards that over time. So if I think I were to leave you with just one thing, I would leave you with something the Dalai Lama said in his teachings. Um, I, I, I'm fundamentally not a religious person at all, and so I'm gonna leave out the last part that he said, because it doesn't really jive with what I'm trying to tell you. But uh, I'll tell you what it is, but uh, I'm not gonna say it at the same time. He said that death is certain, but the time of death is uncertain. And I think that this is something which is hard to cope with, but it's something I've heard from Bill Binney, actually, which is very inspiring. I've also heard it from Dan Ellsberg, 
they both said that they're old men and they've got nothing to lose and that they're going to do the best that they can because, well, what are they going to do? Jail me for the rest of their life, they say. That's awesome that they would say that because they may only have a little bit of life left. They're both older guys. But I think the important part is to recognize that they're coping with that certainty, that they will have to sleep at night, that they get to choose what they're going to do with the remaining precious bits of time that they have. And they have, cho they have chosen directly and clearly that it is their department to do the things that are within their control, to not sit idly by, to not be complicit in serious things that are going seriously wrong. And so what the Dalai Lama also said was that at the time of death, the only thing that will help you is religious practice. And I think that might be true on a personal level, but on a societal level, another thing that helps is to recognize that we all are going at different paces. And so as people make these choices, they impact the world and what other people can do with their lives. So Bill Binney's actions, he may not live to see all of these things come to fruition, but the important part is that because of what he has done, it has inspired others. And those other people will take action and activity that will make the world a better place. So with that said, I'd like to say that some of the goals I've laid out in this, I'd like to think that they are everyone's department. And happy hacking. Thanks for having me.